Hey everybody, this is Rust from Metro Game Core. Today we are going to review this big old guy. This is the AOK Zoe A1 Pro. Now this one has an upgraded chip inside of it. It's the Ryzen 7840U. And so we should get better performance than the typical 6800U handhelds that we've seen over the past year. Additionally, there are a couple things that make this one stand out from the other handheld PCs on the market. Number one is this big old screen. It is eight inches with a resolution of 1920 by 1200. And the visual experience on this is basically second to none compared to other handheld PCs. And there are a couple things that are worth noting about this one as well, including some really nice chunky and comfortable grips, and then also a significant 65 watt hour battery inside as well. And so hopefully all of these things will kind of come together to get a very good handheld PC gaming experience. Now I have reviewed another AOK Zoe product before. It was the original A1. That one was just a prototype and I really didn't like the D-pad. And so that's something we're gonna test extensively in this one here as well. When it comes down to it, my goal of this video here is to kind of walk you through the experience of owning an AOK Zoe A1 Pro and whether or not it's gonna be a good match for you. And it's getting harder and harder to make that assessment given the fact that we have so many different options available on the market today. Either way, if you're interested to see what the AOK Zoe A1 Pro can bring to the table, or maybe you already have a Steam Deck or you've pre-ordered an ROG Ally and you wanna see what the competition's gonna be like, this is gonna be the video for you. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive in. All right, as always, we'll get started with the specs. Like I mentioned, this device has the new Ryzen 7840U APU. When it comes to RAM, this device will come with 32 gigabytes standard, but you can upgrade to 64 if you'd like. Additionally, this is using a 2280 M.2 NVMe slot, and the storage capacity can go anywhere from 512 gigs up to two terabytes. Now, one of my favorite aspects of this device is the display. It is eight inches with a resolution of 1920 by 1200, and it has an aspect ratio of 16 by 10, the same as the Steam Deck. As far as battery size, we're looking at 65 watt hours. So that's gonna be over 50% bigger than the Steam Deck or the ROG Ally. And it does come equipped with hall sensor analog sticks as well as analog triggers. As far as connectivity, we have two different USB-C ports that are USB 4, and there's also a single USB-A port as well. It also features Wi-Fi 6E as well as Bluetooth 5.2. And the A1 Pro is running Windows 11 Home as its main operating system. In terms of other features, it also has gyroscopic controls as well as a rumble function and RGB lighting. Now I think because of the overall size of this device, including the screen, I think it's a good time to just jump directly into a size comparison. And up first we have the Steam Deck. Now surprisingly, the size between the two is not that far off. The Steam Deck's a little bit wider, but the AOK Zoe is just a hair taller. And if anything, I think it makes it more impressive everything they've crammed into the A1 Pro. Because as you can see here, the one inch difference between the screens is kind of massive. Now, as you can see here, the ROG Ally is quite a bit smaller than the A1 Pro. Part of that has to do with the fact that the A1 Pro is significantly less tall because it's a 16 by nine display. But again, same impression here that the AOK Zoe screen is just much bigger than the others. For some other comparisons for scale, here is the GPD Win 4, which of course the A1 Pro absolutely dwarfs. And it's a similar story with the most recent iNeo device, which is the Air Plus right here. This one has a 6 inch 16 by 9 display and I think these are basically apples and oranges. Another device worth comparing to is the iNeo 2. This one also has a fairly compact size and a nice bezel-less screen. In fact, the only handheld I own that's significantly larger than the A1 Pro is this one here, the One X Player 2. And these two are basically sister companies, and so that's why the design language between the two is very similar. You'll also see some similarities in the software here in a moment. In the end, I think that my size impressions of the A1 Pro are basically the same as the Steam Deck. In fact, carrying either of these two devices around is basically the same experience. Here's a great example. This TomTalk case, which is specifically made for the Steam Deck, fits the A1 Pro perfectly. And so if you're familiar with the size of the Steam Deck and it doesn't bother you, then I think it's gonna be a very similar experience right here. Along those same lines, let's talk about weight. So this one weighs 730 grams. Now, if we compare that to a smaller handheld like the Air Plus, then yes, it's gonna be much heavier. This one's only 515. Moving on to what I would classify as like middleweight devices, the GPD Win 4 is 608 grams, and the ROG Ally is 612. And one of Asus's big selling points about the ROG Ally is that it's 10% lighter than the Steam Deck. And it's the opposite experience with the AOK Zoe. At 730 grams, that makes it about 10% heavier than devices like the iNeo 2 and the Steam Deck. 
Again, the only device I have that's heavier than the AOK Zoe is going to be my One X Player 2. And honestly, I think that 730 grams is pretty impressive for a device that has the same size screen as the One X Player. Overall, when it comes to weight, I really don't notice a difference between the Steam Deck and this one, much like I didn't really notice a difference between the ROT Ally and the Steam Deck 2. Okay, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and do a quick unboxing. A couple notes here. Number one, this is a prototype unit sent to me from AOK Zoe, and so things may change when they get to the final retail unit, which will be shipping starting next month. Inside, we have a quick user manual, which is basically just a QR code, and then it comes with a braided USB-C cable for charging, as well as a 65-watt charging brick. Now, on their crowdfunding campaign, they do say that you have the ability to upgrade to a 100-watt charger if you'd like. Speaking of which, let's go and check out that campaign. It's on Indiegogo right now, and there's about a week left. And one thing to note here is that the early bird pricing during this pre-order period is very reasonable. For example, the lowest tier model is $799, but that comes with a brand new chip as well as 32 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. And when you consider the fact that the high-spec ROG Ally is only $100 cheaper than that, this is actually a pretty fair deal given the fact that you have double the RAM, a larger screen, and a much bigger battery. But we'll do a more direct comparison between those two near the end of the video. However, I do want to note that after the early bird pricing is ending, it's going to be $1,000 for each of these. And if you'd like to have further storage or RAM upgrades, those are available on this page as well. But of course, bear in mind that the price will climb significantly depending on what you add. Okay, now first impressions with the device itself is, yeah, this screen is absolutely huge. And this was a similar experience with the original A1. It feels like this thing is more screen than anything else. And personally, I really like that feeling because after all, you're going to spend most of your time looking at that screen, and so it does make sense that it's so large. Now, second impression, I'm not a huge fan of this circuit board or gamer style that we have in the design. I think overall, the design language here is just more reminiscent of something from like the mid to late 2000s. And the overall look and feel of this is basically the exact same as the original A1. My guess here is they're using the same shells, but with new components inside. Up next, let's take a look at these controls. We'll start with the analog sticks. Like I mentioned, these are magnetic hall sensors, which means they're not going to be prone to stick drift. And they have a good amount of range to these sticks themselves and feel nice and smooth. But I do have to say that given that we have such a large device, it feels like these sticks are a little bit too small. It feels like the rest of the device is console sized. It's much bigger than anything else on the market. But somehow these sticks just feel a little bit smaller by comparison. Also up top on the left here, we have a select button. Up next, we have the dreaded D-pad. And this is something that I really didn't enjoy about the first one. And it's been a while since I used that one, but this one does feel different than before. Number one, the design of this D-pad is a little bit flatter than I remember, and it has a very shallow travel to it, and it feels like it has a mix between a rubber membrane and a soft dome click. And as I press down on each of the directions as well as the diagonals, I can feel when it actually hits. And so while there is very shallow travel to this D-pad, and it doesn't feel like it has a lot of pivot to it either, I do still feel like I'm getting a somewhat precise input right here. And this was not something that I felt with the original, which had a rubber membrane connection and just kind of felt loose and mushy. And after about a week of testing with this D-pad, I think the best way to show an example is actually during gameplay. So we'll start with the Contra test here on the NES. On this one, if I try to push all the way down on the D-pad and then also rock left and right, my character actually remains relatively stationary. Now if I give it a little bit less pressure on the bottom and then start rocking again, then yes, I will feel that difference. And I found in actual gameplay, this is the exact amount of diagonal input that I would like. And so playing a game like Contra is relatively easy. I know when I'm pressing a diagonal and I also know when I'm pressing down. Another good example is going to be a precision platformer like Celeste. In this scene right here, I'm doing a number of different things where I'm jumping diagonally and then also straight and then also straight up. And I remember my original A1 review, I had a very hard time playing this game with that D-pad. But as you can see here, anytime I want to go diagonal, my character will. And then same thing when I want to go straight onto that platform or then jump straight up from there. Now pay no mind to the fact that I'm dying a bunch because I'm just bad at video games. But overall, from a D-pad perspective, when I want to go diagonal, it works. And when I want to go straight to a cardinal input, it also works there as well. And so for me personally, I would be very comfortable playing retro games and platforming games with this D-pad. I think to summarize the D-pad experience, we need to switch over to wife hands. This is my wife here playing Dr. Mario. And this is a game she plays every single day and she's super good at it. 
And so I asked her to test out this D-pad while playing this game. And this is something she'll typically do with any handheld that I review. And there are very few of them that she actually enjoys. And she said that this one might be one of the best she's ever tried. Now bear in mind that Dr. Mario is a game that does not use diagonals. So this is a four-way direction that she's using right here. And the way she described it is that when she wanted to do something with the D-pad, she could just all of a sudden do it. And based on what she had told me, this is something that kind of rarely happens for her. And so I would say I know a lot of people are worried about the D-pad, myself included but after using this for about a week, I actually came away a fan. I think overall, I would still prefer a cross-style design, but in the end, this is a D-pad that I don't mind using. Now moving along, this button right here will show the desktop as well as bring up the AOK Zoe software. And we also have one of our two front-firing stereo speakers right here as well. Moving over to the right side, we have our start button on the top right, and then of course we have these four face buttons. These have a rubber membrane connection to them and feel nice and responsive. I also like the fact that they are flat and glossy. They feel really good to press down on, they remind me a bit of a PlayStation controller's buttons. And I also like the fact that they're a little bit oversized compared to other handhelds, and so yes, I think these are great buttons. Also on the right, we have another analog stick and then these two function buttons here. The top one will bring up the keyboard and the bottom one will bring up a quick menu. And of course, we'll test these as well as the audio here later. Moving up top, we have our shoulder buttons. Now these have a soft clickiness to them and are relatively easy to press down on other than at the very top. If you were to press down up here at the hinge, it just doesn't really press down. But that's not really how these buttons are designed. You're supposed to wrap your finger around it. And in that case, it is very easy to press down on these. Now moving on to these analog triggers, these also feel pretty good as well. If anything, I would say that the amount of travel that we have right here is a little bit more than I would like. I think it just takes a little bit more time to go all the way down than I personally would prefer. But overall, I would say it's still a net positive when it comes to these triggers. Up next, let's take a look at the IO on top. So we have a power button and then our two volume buttons. It should be noted here that the volume up is on the left as opposed to the right. Also up top, we have an LED charging indicator, a headphone jack, and then one of our two USB 4 ports. And then of course our single USB-A port and then our exhaust vent here behind them. Now on the bottom we have our other USB 4 port. But one thing to note about this is that it's a little bit inset into the case. And personally I'm not a huge fan of this design right here. Number one, it makes it a little bit harder to plug something into it. And it's especially apparent when you try to use a dock with a bottom connector like this one here from Ioneo. For all intents and purposes, this dock should be a perfect solution for a setup like this. But unfortunately, the USB-C connector is not quite long enough to breach all the way into the USB port on the bottom. And so unfortunately, this Ioneo dock is not compatible with the AOK Zoe A1 Pro. Instead, I would recommend looking into a third-party dock like this one from iVoller, which has those plugs at the top. And that'll make it a lot easier to plug into the A1 Pro. And so here's a typical setup like this where I have the HDMI out and then also I've connected to my 2.4 gigahertz controller. Either way, yes, I'm not a fan of this USB-C port design on the bottom, but I do like the fact that they have a micro SD card slot here on the bottom for easy storage expansion. Okay, now let's take a look at the back. So we have a little bit of branding and then also this large fan intake right here in the center. And then finally, this one also has a kickstand as you can see right here. This is a little bit bigger and more sturdy than on the original Nintendo Switch. And this is what it actually looks like when you are propping it up. Personally, I didn't really ever use this, but if you wanted to try out maybe some tabletop co-op gaming, you could definitely do that right here. Either way, yes, that's the kickstand right here. Okay, next let's talk about these grips and the overall ergonomic experience of the A1 Pro. And as you can see, these are very chunky grips and they feel very natural in the hand. In fact, these grips are so big that it basically doesn't feel like a compromise to hold this handheld. In fact, the only other handheld I can think of that feels as naturally luxurious as this one is going to be the Steam Deck. In fact, for my medium-sized hands, it almost gets to the point where it feels a little bit bigger than it needs to be. And honestly, I think that's a great feeling. And if you have larger hands, I think this is going to be a really great fit too. I think the best way to describe it is that when you pick up this handheld, it's one of those rare experiences when you think to yourself, oh yeah, this was actually made with human hands in mind. Because I do find that this A1 Pro is a very comfortable handheld to hold. And mostly that's going to be thanks to the larger grips, but then also the rounded curves that we have here in the bottom corners. So yes, I would say I'm a big fan of the ergonomics of this device overall. Now one thing to bear in mind when it comes to a large size device like this is the placement of the buttons and controls. And there are a couple things to note right here. Like I mentioned already, it does feel like the sticks are a little bit too small. And I also wish that the right stick was a little bit higher in the overall design too. And I think where these controls shine the most is when it comes to dual stick analog gameplay. So things like twin stick shooters where you need to access the D-pad and face button on occasion are very easy to use. 
You do have to shift your hands a little bit to reach the select and start buttons because they are up so high, but when you're actually playing a game, I think that's going to be a rare occurrence. Same thing with the bottom function buttons, it is a bit of a stretch to actually reach down and touch them. But these are buttons that you will rarely even touch when you're actually playing a game, so I don't think it's a bad thing there either. In the end, much like how it was with the original A1, this is a device I feel is just tailor-made for playing twin-stick shooters. I remember really enjoying playing Destiny 2 on the original A1, and it was the exact same thing with the A1 Pro. In fact, this was the game that I ended up playing the most in my spare time during my testing, and then I also played a lot of Marvel Spider-Man, and these were both very comfortable control schemes for both of these games. And then finally, one last thing to note about the overall experience of holding this device in your hands. Unfortunately, they're using a similar type of plastic finish that they have on a lot of other Chinese-based handhelds. And unfortunately, with darker colored devices like this dark blue one right here, you can see that the fingerprint smudges will show up a lot over time. Bear in mind, this is after a week straight of testing, but all the same, if this bothers you like it does for me, you may not enjoy this experience. All right, moving along, let's talk about the screens. A couple things to note here. Number one, we've already talked about the larger size with the eight inches versus the seven inches on the Steam Deck. But another thing to note here is that the colors are very rich and vibrant on the AOK Zoe as well. Here I am comparing to the Steam Deck without the saturation plugin turned on. And then here's a comparison against the ROG Ally. And I would say here that the A1 Pro definitely has more saturated and vibrant colors. The only non-OLED panel that I have that's more saturated than the A1 Pro is going to be the iNeo 2. And this one here on the bottom is very, very saturated. In fact, I've described this as being OLED-like. And honestly, as you can see here, there's not a huge difference in the saturation quality between the two. So if anything, I think that goes to show just how nice and vibrant the screen is on the A1 Pro. Between that and the high resolution and large size, this is a very nice gaming experience. Now another thing I like to test is going to be the dimness and brightness. And this right here is actually at 0% brightness, and it's still pretty bright. And here's a demonstration of what it's going to be like in a dark environment. And when compared to the Steam Deck, which has a very nice dim quality to it, as you can imagine, I would much rather play the Steam Deck in the dark than the A1 Pro. And so probably not something you'd want to play in a bed next to your significant other. Now when we look at max brightness, this also actually doesn't get quite as bright as the Steam Deck, although it is pretty close. It's kind of hard to compare between the two just because the Steam Deck gets so washed out at that max brightness. But as a good example, here's what it's like to play this outdoors. Now this is a cloudy day, and so it's not direct sunlight, but all the same in this environment, environment, I would be perfectly comfortable playing this outside. Okay, next let's do an audio test. First thing here is that we have front firing speakers, which I always appreciate. But I did find that the overall sound quality of this device is a little bit muted and muffled. So what I'll do right here is I'll give you a listen at max volume, and then I'll also compare it at max volume to the Steam Deck and the ROG Ally. And so as you heard, this is definitely less loud than the other two devices, and it also lacks a little bit of that clarity and punch. In the end, I still think the sound quality is pretty good here, it's just not quite at that really high tier like it is with the Steam Deck or the Ally. Another frequent question I get about handheld PCs is the overall fan noise. So here I'm pushing this all the way up to the highest it can go at 28 watts, and so here's a listen to the fan at max speed. Overall, I would say it's relatively loud, but not quite as loud as the Steam Deck. To give you an example, at max fan speed, I found I had to turn up the volume to about 75% overall so that I didn't really notice the fan anymore. And here's a listen to what that's going to sound like with both the fan speed at max as well as 75% volume. And then finally, one last thing to note right here is that when we're pushing the heat really hard on the device like this, there's still a good amount of distance between the CPU and fan and your fingers. And so even though the device itself will get relatively hot, I've found that it doesn't get hot around my hands. 
Okay, that's about it when it comes to hardware. So now let's talk about software. To start, we're gonna press the button on the bottom left. This is what they call the One X console. And this is a front end launcher that'll scan all the games you have installed in your computer and then you can launch them from here. But I did wanna note that within the power menu on the top left, you are able to turn off the entire device. Now let's talk about that quick menu on the bottom right. And this is very similar to what you can find on One X player devices. Here you can quickly adjust your power profile via TDP. A couple other handy functions are the ability to change the screen resolution on the fly. And you can also adjust your RGB lighting thanks to about a half dozen different presets. Personally, I like the one that's called flowing light, but each of these are pretty neat. Another thing I like about this quick menu is that they have pre-configured data charts. And so if you want to do things like adjust the global frame rate or bring up a menu of all the different data points, you can do all that right here. And this is what it'll look like when you have it enabled. It'll show you your CPU and GPU clocks as well as overall load and temperature. And you can also see your total power package, so how much the battery is draining, and your battery life and estimated time remaining. And then finally, you can also see your TDP and frames per second. And so if you don't want to configure something like MSI Afterburn, this is going to be a really handy solution. And really, other than the brightness and volume functions that we have here on the bottom, that's about it for the quick menu. And then one last thing, if you press that keyboard button on the bottom, this is what it's going to look like here. It's got a bit of a matrix looks to it. It's a little bit gaudy, but all the same, it works well. Okay, before we get into gameplay testing, we're going to switch things up and actually talk about battery life first. If you're new to the channel or these reviews, what I usually will do is just a real world example of what it's like to play certain games at different power profiles. And so as we get started here on the top right, you can see that it takes about 90 minutes to charge from zero to 100 using a 65 watt charger. And I found that when you tap on the power button to put the device to sleep, you're gonna lose about 3% battery over a period of about 12 hours. And finally of note, I tested all of these games at 50% brightness with 50% volume. Now let's start on the right and then work our way to the left. So this is gonna be our lowest power profile right here at the very bottom TDP, which is four watts. And you can see for all these games, I tested them at the max resolution of 1200p. And so with a lightweight game like SteamWorld Dig 2 at 1200p and four watts, I still got a very stable 60 frames per second. And that gave me a battery life of just under six and a half hours. Now, if you wanted to reduce the resolution to 800p instead, and maybe turn off the Wi-Fi, things like that, you could definitely get over seven hours if you'd like as well. Moving on from there, I doubled the TDP up to eight watts, and then I played a GameCube game, so Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door. And here I did a 3x upscale up to 1080p, and also had very stable 60 frames per second. And with this setup here, I got four hours and 21 minutes. So that's a pretty hefty amount of game time too. But I will say that the sweet spot for the CPU when it comes to both performance and battery life, I found to be at about 15 watts altogether. For this game, I could play it at a 1200p resolution with low settings and then FSR turned on to the quality setting. And this setup right here gave me a comfortable 47 frame per second average. And as I'll show you here later on in the gameplay demonstration, this both looked good and played very well too. And of course, as you can see with the 65 watt hour battery, we get a little bit less than three hours of gameplay with these settings right here. And like I mentioned, this is the sweet spot for me. I think that three hours is a great amount of time for PC gaming. And I also found that the visual quality that you can attain with 15 watts is about perfect for me as well. But of course you could always push that. So for example, with Destiny 2, I tried to get as close to 60 frames per second as I could. And this required me to use 1200p with low settings and with a 20 watt TDP. And this was a very good experience. It looked good and played very smooth as well. And with these TDP settings, I got well over two hours of battery life too. And then finally, if you really want, you can push it all the way to the edge at 28 watt TDP. That's gonna allow you to play some pretty hefty duty games like Elden Ring at 1200p with high settings. And even then it's gonna give you a frame rate well over 30. So about 38 frames per second on average with this game. But bear in mind that is gonna tax the device quite a bit. So you're gonna get a little bit less than an hour and a half of battery life. So for me personally, this kind of setup would be good only if I have a little bit of time to play or I'm actually gonna play it while plugged in. Anyway, that's what you can expect when it comes to battery life. Anywhere from an hour and a half if you really push it or all the way up to six and a half hours or more if you're playing something very lightweight. So now let's go ahead and jump into the gameplay testing. We're gonna start with PC games and we'll do the lightweight stuff first and work our way up from there. Now the quick menu will allow you to go all the way down to a four watt TDP, but on the actual graphics up here on the top left, you can see that it hovers around five watts instead. Either way, you can expect a total package power of between nine and 10 watts altogether. And if you do the math of 10 watts of power with a 65 watt hour battery, that means you're gonna get six and a half hours of battery life. 
And so that's what I would expect if you're going to be playing some lightweight indie games, you know, those that aren't too taxing on the system. Now, as you start moving things up, I found that other games like Horizon Chase Turbo required an 8 watt TDP to run at full speed. And along those same lines, as you start getting a little bit more intensive, games like Hades ran best at a 10 watt TDP. And of course, bear in mind that I'm playing all these games at a 1200p resolution. So if you drop down the resolution to 800p instead, you could definitely get a lower TDP. Moving on from there, I found that quite a few games do play well at a 12 watt TDP, including games like Ori and the Will of the Wisps, as well as Grand Theft Auto V. For both of these, using medium to low settings, I was able to get a pretty stable 60 frames per second or higher. But of course, as I mentioned during my battery testing, I found that the sweet spot was 15 watts. At this power profile, I found that some older games like Halo Reach and Bioshock Infinite will play at 1200p with medium settings and very, very good gameplay. But when it came to some of the heavy duty games, you know, something like Rise of the Tomb Raider, 15 watts would not give me a full 60 frames. Instead, I was getting somewhere between like 35 and 40, which is still a very comfortable way to play this game. However, if you want to get something closer to 60 frames per second, then you will have to drop the resolution. So for example, here with the same 15 watt TDP, if I drop it down to an 800p resolution with the lowest settings possible, you can see here I'm getting a relatively stable 60 frames per second with the same scene. And so as always, it'll come down to what compromises you're willing to make between the graphics, the power profile, or the resolution. Here's another example of the options available to you when you're trying to figure out how you want to play these games. With Horizon Zero Dawn here with a 15 watt TDP, I can play at 1200p with low settings and I can get an average frame rate of about 30 to 33 frames per second. And this is a nice experience, even though it's on low settings, it still looks very good on this big screen. But if you wanna take it down just a hair further, you could turn on FSR to the quality settings. And this will give you a jump of about 15 frames per second with the same power profile. And honestly, I can't really tell a difference between the two. And so personally, this is the setup that I was using when I was playing this game. The 1200p low settings with FSR quality still look really good. And personally, I think the average of 45 frames per second feels a lot smoother than 30. And of course, if you want to push it even more, you could drop down the resolution to something like 800p instead. And then also if you bumped up the TDP to something a little bit higher, like 20 watts, you can get very close to 60 frames per second. However, with this setup, I think you can definitely tell the difference between the visual quality between the 1200 and 800p. And so in general, I found that when testing this device, I favored having higher graphics over higher frame rate. For example, here with Spider-Man, I am playing this at a 15 watt TDP with 1200p resolution, but with low settings. And here I'm getting an average of about 35 frames per second. And for me personally, I didn't want to reduce my battery life by increasing the TDP. And I also didn't want to compromise on the graphics. And so instead, I just went ahead and turned on V-Sync at 30 frames per second. And so now I'm getting a very stable frame rate and it's looking good. Either way, that's one of the nice things about the AOK Zoe is that we have this nice powerful chip inside which does give us the freedom of choice. Next, I want to do a couple examples when it comes to playing this game in handheld mode versus docked. So here we are with God of War at 1080p with low settings and at a 15 watt TDP, I'm getting a pretty stable 30 frames. It would dip down to under 30 from time to time, but overall I would say this is very comfortably playable. Now, if you wanted to improve the graphics, you could increase the TDP all the way up to the 28 watts. And that will allow you to bump up the graphics from low to medium or what they call original in this game. And yes, it definitely does look better, but like I mentioned before, it will drain the battery quite a bit more. And so I think a setup like this is going to be best when you have it plugged in or docked like you see here. Or on the flip side, maybe you're playing a game like Control, which also like with God of War at a 15 watt TDP with 1200p in low settings, you will get above 30 frames per second. And I think this is a perfectly enjoyable experience right here. However, you might be interested in a higher frame rate. So here we're gonna go up to a 28 watt TDP, but this time we're gonna keep the graphics the same. But as you can see right here, we're getting an average of about 50, 55 frames per second instead of 30. And so when you have it plugged up like this, it's really gonna come down to what you prefer between graphics and frame rate. Either way, I found myself perfectly content to use a 15 watt TDP for most games, and it would allow me to use a 1200p resolution. For example, here with Elden Ring, I could play it in medium settings and it looked great, and I was getting an average about 30-35 frames per second. It's also a similar story with Final Fantasy VII Remake. Here 
here I am playing it at a 1080p with high textures. And here with a 15 watt TDP, I can get an average of about 45 frames altogether. And it's a pretty similar experience here with The Witcher as well. 1200p, medium settings, 15 watt TDP. And I'm getting gameplay that's comfortably over 30 frames per second. Now with any of these games, you can drop down the resolution to 800p. And if you lower the settings as well, you can probably push close to 60 frames per second. But like I mentioned, with an eight inch screen like this, I did find that 1200p just looked a lot better. And finally, with Destiny 2, I did want to note here that the statistics do not work with this game. And so all we have is this really tiny text up here on the top right. But on average, with 1200p with low settings and a 20 watt TDP, I could usually hover around 58 frames per second. Not quite 60, but still feels very good. And honestly, when playing games in a handheld mode, I found that 20 watts is about as far as I was willing to push it. Anything after that, you get some really diminishing returns. For example, here with Destiny 2, when I tried to push this all the way to 28 watt TDP, I only got an average of about 61 frames per second. And honestly, I couldn't tell the difference in terms of smoothness between the two. And so for me personally, it just made a lot more sense to use a 20 watt TDP and save that additional hour of battery life. In a nutshell, when playing PC games on the A1 Pro, it is a very nice experience. Not only are the controls good, but the screen is awesome and the performance is there to match it too. But of course, PC games are only one side of the coin when it comes to this channel. So let's talk about emulation next. Starting with the low end systems, as you can imagine, we can play this at the very lowest TDP and get some really great gameplay. And thanks to that taller 16 by 10 aspect ratio, when playing four by three content like this, these games end up filling out a lot of the screen. And so if you wanna play some classic retro games, this is a really nice experience. And the 1200p resolution does a pretty good job of scaling as well. As you can see here with Mega Man X with integer scaling turned off, we're still getting a pretty nice pixel balance. So overall, I think when it comes to playing retro games on a very large screen, this is going to be a good fit too. And it's especially good when playing Game Boy Advance games because the aspect ratio of this original console was very similar to 16 by 10. And so these games are going to look massive on this 8 inch screen. Now moving on to middle tier systems, things like Dreamcast, Nintendo 64, and PSP, I found that these games can upscale to 1080p no problem with an 8 watt TDP. And if you remember from my battery testing earlier, that's going to get us a little bit less than four and a half hours of gameplay altogether. Now given the fact that we have a powerful chip, you can also push some of these retro games as well. For example, here with Sega Saturn, I'm using the most accurate and demanding core, and I've also added a pretty hefty CRT shader as well. So with a setup like this, I did have to go all the way up to a 15 watt TDP, but I found the gameplay to be very smooth and looks really nice with that CRT shader as well. And so if you want to really fiddle around with these shaders and settings with some of these retro games, you can get a really nice experience on this big screen. Moving up from there, let's try Nintendo GameCube, and I tested with some pretty hard to run games. With Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes, I found that an 8 watt TDP was just enough to be able to play at full speed. I would get some dips below 60 frames per second, but this game was able to accommodate that and I didn't feel any slowdown. So I would say for most games, leading up to the harder to play games like Metal Gear Solid, an 8 watt TDP should be fine. However, for those really hard to play games like F-Zero GX, you may have to push it all the way to a 15 watt TDP. Regardless, any GameCube game is going to be completely playable, it's just a matter of finding the right TDP for the requirement. And it's a similar story with Nintendo Wii, although most of these games did require a 15 watt TDP. Moving on from there, it's a similar story with PlayStation 2. There are many games that will play just fine with an 8 watt TDP, like Dragon Quest VIII. However, as you start getting to the higher level games like Burnout Revenge or God of War 2, these ones played best at a 10 watt TDP. And also bear in mind, I'm running these games at a 3x upscale, so they are playing at a 1080p resolution. But again, much like with GameCube, all these games are going to be playable. Even the hardest to run games like Champions and Norrath still played at a 1080p resolution at a 15 watt TDP. So when it comes to the sixth generation of consoles, this is going to be just great. Moving on from there, let's test out Nintendo 3DS. This one I found played best at a 10 watt TDP. And here I'm playing at a 3x resolution, and yes, these games are playing just fine too. Moving on from there, let's go to Nintendo Wii U. This one required a little bit more power than something like GameCube, but I didn't find that most games played at a 10 watt TDP really well. So for example here with Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD as well as New Super Mario Bros. U, yeah, 10 watt TDP is just great. However, as you can imagine, some of the more intensive games like Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, this one did require a 15 watt TDP. But even then I upscaled this to a 1200p resolution and I was still getting an average frame rate of about 35 frames per second even during the most intensive parts like this. 
Now I'm not going to show off any Switch emulation right here just because Nintendo is going a little bit crazy right now. But I will say that most games play just fine on the Switch emulators with a 15 or a 20 watt TDP. Now one of the systems I was most interested in testing was the PlayStation 3, so let's do that one next. And for this one I found that a 15 watt TDP would cover most games really well. So some of those easier to play games like Afterburner Climax and Dead or Alive 5, yeah 15 watts absolutely no problem. And same thing with a number of other games like Top Spin 4 and Demon Souls and even Wipeout HD. And so I would say for the most part, if you're going to be playing a 2D based game or something that's a little bit light 3D, then yeah, you can probably play it at a 15 watt TDP with absolutely no problem. Now, when it comes to more intense 3D games, you may have to bump up that TDP. So for example, with Devil May Cry, as well as Ratchet and Clank Quest for Booty, I found that for these, a 20 watt TDP was the best. And at this power profile, you'll still get well over two hours of gameplay out of the battery too. And I think another great example of how this chipset does really well with PlayStation 3 is going to be Prince of Persia. This is a game that really struggles to get 30 frames per second in this open area right here. But as you can see at a 20 watt TDP, it is running at 30 frames per second solid. It does not dip down below it at all. In fact, this is running so well that I decided to try the hardest to emulate game that I have in my catalog. And this is a game that I've never actually been able to run on an APU before today. But as you can see here at a 28 watt TDP, I'm able to run Infamous at a frame rate that is well over 30 frames per second. And so apart from some graphical glitches that are inherent with emulating this game itself, I would say this is perfectly playable. So if you are looking for a handheld specifically to play PlayStation 3, this chipset is going to work out really well. Moving on from there, let's go ahead and test out some Microsoft systems. Starting with the original Xbox, we're going to play this at a 2x resolution and a 15 watt TDP. And I found that actually works out pretty well for most games. For Dead or Alive 3 and Soul Calibur 2, I was getting some dips here and there, but all the same, I would still say this is a relatively playable experience at 15 watts. And it's a similar experience with the first Halo. Again, with a 2x resolution and a 15 watt TDP. This one would also dip below 30 frames per second here and there, but all the same, I still found it to be very playable. And then finally, I also wanted to test out some Xbox 360 games. Mostly, I was interested to see what kind of performance I could get at that 15 watt TDP. And sure enough, these games also played really well at this sweet spot. And so I would say as long as your Xbox 360 game is going to be compatible with the emulator, it should run really well here on the AOK -OK Zoe. Okay, with all of that exhaustive testing out of the way, let's go ahead and start wrapping things up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the AOK -OK Zoe A1 Pro. And as always, we'll start with what I like. Number one is going to be the big 8 inch screen that we have on this device. Not only is the size itself impressive, but the 1200p resolution makes these games look excellent. And I think they did a really good job with color accuracy as well as saturation. I'm also a big fan of the performance that we saw here, especially at that middle ground of 15 watt TDP. When it comes down to it, every single game I tried was completely playable. It was just a matter of finding that balance between the power profile and the graphics settings. And it makes me very excited to see other devices coming out with the same chipset because I think this one is a real winner. I also love the fact that this device had a 65 watt hour battery. Altogether, these three make a very good combination. We have a screen that has a bunch of pixels and then a CPU that can push all that resolution as well. And then finally, we have that large battery that allows us to continue that nice graphical experience for hours on end. I also like the ergonomics on this device. It is both chunky and comfortable, and I think if you have larger hands, you're going to really like it too. I also think that the early bird pricing for that base model of $799 is very fair. And we'll do a bit of a value comparison here in the next section. I also wanted to make note that I did see that there was an improved D-pad over the original prototype that I had back last year. And so personally, I no longer think that the D-pad is a weak spot on this device. I also like the fact that we have three different USB ports, including the USB-A port, which is going to be great if you need to plug in something like a flash drive. And of course, having USB 4 ports means that you can use things like external GPUs as well. Next, let's talk about some of the things I didn't like about the A1 Pro. Number one, I think that the analog sticks are just a little bit too small. This is a device that feels oversized in almost every single way except for that. I also don't like that the plastic finish on this device is very smudgy. So if you are thinking about getting one, I would recommend considering the white model instead. I also found that it took a little bit of a stretch to reach the start and select buttons, and depending on the size of your hands, that might bother you over time. I was also not a big fan of this circuit or gamery style design that they have on the front as well. It just feels a little bit dated. And then finally, I did want to make note that AOK -OK Zoe is still a relatively new company. 
And I've read from a number of sources that the original A1 had a number of issues when it came to both hardware and software. And there were quite a few customers who were dissatisfied with the amount of support that they had if they did have issues with their device. And so I did want to make a note that if you do buy a device like this directly from China, you won't have the same level of support like you would if you were buying the Valve Steam Deck or the ROG Ally if you pick it up from Best Buy. Of course, when it comes to any of these handheld PCs, it's always going to be a gamble. But at least when it came to the original A1, it did seem like this one was a little bit riskier compared to something like an Ioneo device, which is a little bit more established. Now, in the end, you're probably wondering whether or not I recommend purchasing the A1 Pro in the first place. And honestly, I think the best way to determine whether or not this device is going to be a good fit for you is to actually compare it against the Asus ROG Ally. And there's a couple reasons why I want to do that. Number one, they are both relatively recent releases that are coming out next month, but they also have a similar price point and run Windows. So let's do a quick head-to-head -head comparison against some of their features. Number one, when it comes to price, yes, the 699 ROG Ally is $100 cheaper than the A1 Pro. But you have to also bear in mind the amount of upgrades you're going to get for $100 with the AOK Zoe. For example, you're going to get a much larger screen and a larger battery and double the RAM. On top of that, you get a more standard 2280 M.2 slot, which is going to be a lot easier and cheaper to upgrade if you want to do that down the line. Now, I do think it is a little bit too early to say that the 7840U is better or worse than the Z1 Extreme. I think we need several months of testing and driver updates before we can really get a better picture of that. But there are a couple things that are better about the ROG Ally, which are worth mentioning as well. Number one, that device has a 120 Hertz variable refresh rate. Additionally, if weight is a concern for you, this one is quite a bit lighter than the A1 Pro. And there's something to be said about the peace of mind that comes from buying a device from a big place like Best Buy. I think when it comes down to it, pound for pound, if we're talking about features and price, if you think that the ROG Ally is a good value for what you're getting at $699, the early bird pricing of $799 for the A1 Pro is just as good, if not a little bit better, given the fact that you have those additional features. It's really going to come down to what you prefer, having a higher refresh rate and the peace of mind from buying from Best Buy, or do you want to take a chance on a larger screen, larger battery, and more RAM? In the end, I do think that the A1 Pro is a very good handheld PC. After all, my favorite features about a handheld are all present here. We have a big screen, big performance, and big battery, and it's a comfortable device to hold overall. And so if you are in the market for a Windows-based handheld and you like these features, then yes, I do think the A1 Pro is worth your consideration if it's within your budget. However, if you have any sort of hesitation about this device, then I would say that maybe it's better to hold off. Because already, two other companies have announced handhelds that are going to be using the same chip. And so my expectation is that six months from now, we'll have even more choice within this space. Either way, let me know what you think about the A1 Pro in the comments below. Is this one just right for you, or is there something holding you back? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.